Good evening. Ulysses, the solar polar probe, is now flying over the south pole of the sun and showing us regions we've never properly seen before because normally we see the sun broadside on, so to speak. Oddly enough, Ulysses is further away from the sun than we are and will never go closer. All the same, we are learning a great deal from it. And of course, we are still getting pictures back of the impact of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. This Hubble picture shows impact G, and this superb picture shows the full effects. And I think that the effects of that are going to take a long time to die away. Of course, the actual impacts occurred on the side of Jupiter turned away from us, but they were observed by the Galileo spacecraft. That's an impression of Galileo, though it's not quite right, because I'm afraid the high-gain antenna has not unfurled properly, which is why it was out so slow to come back. But we have got these pictures of impact W, taken at intervals of just over two seconds. You can see there the main flash on the third picture, possibly due to the fireball, as the comet's body actually hit Jupiter itself. Now, those results were given at the recent meeting of the International Astronomical Assembly, held in The Hague, I was just back from there. And also shown there was a picture of a newly discovered galaxy, found by the Dutch with the Radio Astronomy Telescope and confirmed at Panama. A rather a blurred picture, simply because it lies almost behind the Milky Way, which is why it's not been seen before, or not identified before. But it appears to be a rather large spiral, something like nine million light years away, not very far beyond our own local group. Now, it's often said that the evening sky in autumn is less interesting than at other times of the year. In a way, I suppose that's true. We haven't yet got Orion, and we're starting to lose the brilliant summer stars, but at least we do have planets. At the moment, Venus is very low down in the southwest after sunset. It'll be very brilliant, of course. We are losing Jupiter now in the evening twilight, and Mars is a morning object, not well placed yet. But at least we have Saturn, visible in the southeast after sunset. And there's a drawing I made a few nights ago with my 15-inch reflector. And you can see the rings there. They're made of, of course, icy particles going around Saturn. But they are not so well placed as they were a few years ago. Because the rings are measured 169,000 miles from one end to the other, but they are probably less than a mile thick. In the early 1990s, we saw the rings from a very favorable angle, and Saturn looked like this. But it's not quite like that now. They are closing up, as seen from Earth. Now they've got to about this situation. And next year, in 1995, they're going to be edgewise onto us, so they'll appear only as a thin line of light. And in small telescopes, you won't see them at all for a bit. After that, they'll start to open out again. But meanwhile, the rings are visible with a small telescope. And uh, do have a look at them if you can. So you can find Saturn easily enough. And to my mind, telescopically, it is the loveliest object in the entire sky. You know, some people have said to me, it's hard to identify the stars. I don't think that's true. Remember, there are only a few thousand stars visible with the naked eye, and my method has always been to select a few unmistakable groups or constellations and then use them as guides to all the rest. And undoubtedly, the two best guides are Orion the Hunter and Ursa Major the Great Bear. At the moment, Orion's not in the evening sky, it will be, of course, in the winter. But Ursa Major, the Great Bear, is. And over Britain, it never sets, so you can always find it somewhere. Now it's low down in the northern sky. And the seven stars making up what we normally call the plough can't be mistaken. I rather like this picture I took a little while ago. See the bear's tail or the handle of the plough point pointing downwards. And that black mass over to the right is, I'm afraid, an inconvenient chimney. But certainly, Ursa Major is a splendid marker. The two right-hand stars are known as the pointers, because they show the way to Polaris, the pole star, in Ursa Mind of the Little Bear. And Polaris lies within one degree of the polar point, and therefore it appears to stay almost still in the sky, and you always know where it is. The Little Bear itself, by the way, is not very bright, curved down over the Great Bear's tail, but I'm afraid you're not going to see the Little Bear stars uh, on a light night, and therefore that, you really got to wait until the moon's out of the way, and at the moment, the moon, I'm afraid, is rather obtrusive. On the far side of the pole star, we have the W or M of Cassiopeia. And that also is, is circumpolar from here. That's to say it never sets. And the five brightest stars are quite unmistakable. They make up a very characteristic W or M form. And also, near Cassiopeia, we have the constellation of Perseus, the legendary hero. Not very distinctive in shape, but with one fairly bright star and some very interesting objects. Well, those are all on view now. But the main autumn constellation is Pegasus, the flying horse. And the four main stars of Pegasus make up a well-defined square. 
Um, that's a photograph of it, but I always feel that photographs, and for that matter maps, make the square look rather brighter and smaller than it really is. But it's distinctive enough. In mythology, uh, it was a flying horse, but the four main stars do form that characteristic square pattern. There's a picture of the actual mythological horse uh, in uh, the old legend, written by the hero Bellerophon in quest of a particularly nasty fire-breathing monster known as the Chimera. But certainly in the sky, these four stars do make up a well-defined square. And they've all got their own proper names. And those names are Scat, Alphalats, Markab, and Algonib. And the, the three of them are white, and the fourth one, Scat in the upper right, is orange. Now, you might think that those four stars in the square make up a genuine pattern. But in point of fact, they don't. Remember, a constellation has no real meaning at all because the stars are at very different distances from us, and we are simply dealing with line-of-sight effects. And of those stars, the most distant, over 500 light-years away, is Algonib, and the closest is Alpha Rats. So let's now put them in to their correct distances. And you can see what's happening. Over to the right is Algonib. Looks the fancy of the four, much the most powerful, over a thousand times brighter than the sun, and there they are to their correct distances. So in fact, Algonib is further away from Markab than we are. And in astronomy, as in so many other things, appearances can be very deceptive indeed. But from the Earth, from that point of view, they appear as a well-defined square. I'm not going to say it's a very rich area, but of course, binoculars and telescopes show many stars there. Now, this picture was taken by Douglas Arnold, shows many stars. But we're going to dim it down now and show you only the stars that are prominent with the naked eye. And when we do that, well, there we have the square once again. And when the moon is out of the way, have a look with the naked eye and see how many stars you can see inside the square. And there are not very many of them. But one thing you can do is to look at those four stars, one after the other, and then you'll see straight away that although three of them are white, the fourth one, scat, is decidedly orange. And that indicates that the surface temperature is lower than that of the other three, although in fact scat is a very large star, very much larger than our sun. Now, most stars, including our sun, shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But there are some which don't. And one of these variable stars is scat. It's an unstable, ancient star. It's swelling and shrinking, and it's changing in brightness as it does so. And the magnitude range is from about 2.3 to 2.8. And you can quite easily study it from night to night and draw a kind of a light curve, as I did a little while ago. What I did was to compare Scat with Markab, which signs steadily at magnitude 2.5, and Algonib at 2.9. And plotting that from night to night, you can get a well-defined curve, which has a period of something like 38 days. Not absolutely constant, because this is what's called a semi-regular variable, and we never quite know what's going to happen next, but that is the genuine period. And if you follow Scat from night to night and compare it with Markab, you'll see that it really is changing. Now, although the flying horse is marked mainly by the square, it's not the entire constellation. There's more of it, and there's one more fairly bright star, Epsilon Pegasi, or Enif, which again is orange, and uh, more luminous than any of the square stars, over 4,000 times as powerful as the sun. And near that is the totally unremarkable third and a half magnitude star, Theta Pegasi. But those two stars can be used to find something very interesting. Look from Theta through NF, and you'll come to a hazy blob in the sky. You won't see it with the naked eye. You will with binoculars. So simply start with Theta, sweep through NF, and then you'll come to the hazy blob, which marks Messier 15, a well-known globular cluster, not very far below naked eye visibility. And there's a telescopic picture of it. The outer parts are easy to resolve. And these globular clusters are huge symmetrical systems. This one's over 50,000 light years away. And near the center, the stars are pretty closely packed. So if we lived on the planet going around a star in the middle of a globular cluster, our night skies would be glorious, even though, of course, the separations are still of the order of oh, a light month at least, and those stars can hardly ever collide. But certainly, this is one of the best of all globular clusters and very easy to locate. Now, let's go back for a moment to our map of Pegasus. There are the four stars of the square, and there in the upper left is Alpharetz. But for some reason, and I don't know why this is, some years ago, the controlling body of world